the scene in a 360 video can change based on where the user looks at? Tell me more. You are listening to the How to Create VR podcast, weekly conversations with VR and AR professional creators, designers, and producers. Hello and welcome to another episode of the How to Create VR podcast, where I speak with professional creators, designers, developers, and producers who work on VR, AR, and MR projects. I'm Marcelo Lewin, an immersive content evangelist, creator, producer, and the guy behind HowToCreateVR.com. My guests today are Luisa Valencia, a VR director and content creator, and Etienne Archambou, an interactive director, both working at Signal Space Lab. Today, I will speak with both of them about how to create dynamic cinematic VR experiences where scenes actually adjust and change based on where the user is looking at and the decisions he or she made. But before we get started, I want to remind you to register at howtocreatevr.com. It's free and registration gets you access to lots of video tutorials, practice assets, podcast interviews, ability to favorite, comment, create a watch list, and much more. It's really quick and easy. Just visit howtocreatevr.com and click on the register for free button. All right, Luisa, Etienne, welcome to the podcast. Hi. Hi, it's really good to be here. Thanks for having us. I'm glad to have you guys here. It's very intriguing when I've learned that I can watch a video and depending on where I'm looking at and my decisions, different things can happen without me knowing that those different things happen. But we're going to get into that in just a minute. Before we do, maybe Luisa, we'll start with you and you can tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. I guess I always wanted to tell stories, but I'm not really good good in with words, not even in my mother tongue. So I choose the visual language to express myself. I studied visual arts and I ended up in my career having the chance to work both in the front and the back of the production process. I was creating short films and music videos. And at the same time, I was working as an editor. Later on, I became the head of the post-production department of a TV production company. So I guess that having the chance to be both in the front side and in the back side of of the production gave me the, the, the grounds to feel familiar for when VR came to my life. How did VR come to your life? What was your first VR experience? I got into VR while while I was uh, managing the video department of a music production company in Montreal back in 2014. The owner of the company wanted to make the jump into this emerging industry, so he he bought the biggest and most complex VR rig at the time, a GoPro rig with 14 cameras. He grabbed the cameras, the 14 tiny memory cards, a bunch of hard drives, a tripod, and he went to India for one of his musical researches. And so when he came back, he gave me the gear with a bunch of raw material. And he said to me, here, see what (laughs) you can do with that. (laughs) So I was literally thrown into the water without knowing how to swim. (laughs) But it was the best thing that could happen to me uh, in my in my professional life because I got to know VR and I, I've never felt so passionate about something like that in like in the working environment. That's the best way to learn is just jump into the water and figure it out. Exactly. And at that time, the information was very limited, but it was very cool to like dig into it and try to like get my hands dirty with it. And so I managed to stitch all those 14 cameras. <laughs> I don't know how, but that's how I learned. Very cool. Etienne, what about you? What's your background? How did you get into VR? Well, a long time ago, I studied art. For a long time, I was I was doing uh, like VJing and editing, video editing. I was just playing with footage, doing they had, like shows with friends. And that lasted for a long time. But at some point, I moved into change career and I went to the video game industry, just learning the robes. And that was at the start of the mobile explosion just when the first iphone came out i got to learn like grow my skills with the the mobile industry and did that for a long time and what was it like two years ago okay. yeah a friend of mine was talking about what he wanted to do and uh, he was putting me in contact with that that luisa and, and we were just exchanging about what they could do with this deck and for me i kept 
I was curious at that point, like I had just gotten an S6 and a Gear VR and I was starting to just trying to see, okay, what, we, like, what can you do with this right now? And that's when I hopped in and started just, I jumped in to explore the, what was available in that tech at the time. What was your first introduction to VR as a user, both of you guys, as, as a participant in VR, not as a creator? And do you guys remember what that experience was? The first VR experience I, I, I saw or, or I experienced was Strangers with Patrick Watson. It caught me like very deeply. I, I've never felt something like that with an audiovisual medium. I even as for my much love as I feel for film and movies, it was something, something totally different. I was very impressed with the fact of feeling inside a space for me i think the one that caught me was uh, was a bit later i mean it was still from uh, that's these are felix and paul productions dreams of O. dreams of O. yes yeah that one just it just blew my mind like yeah. the way they were playing with the, the parallax the depth the immersion the the composition that really felt like a that felt like like something new as a as a narrative as a as an experience yeah that would that one really set it apart to me as, okay, this is, this is what we can do with this. At Signal Space Lab, do you guys mainly focus on 360 sort of cinematic VR, or are you guys also experimenting with mixing 360 with computer-generated VR? For the current project we're working on, where we, we will introduce CGI elements within the, uh, the experience, but the core, really the core of our expertise is with bringing stereoscopic 360 uh, footage in a dynamic environment. That's really the main focus that we have. Use the tool that are like expanding all the time to do good stereoscopic 360 footage and then adapt that within the game engine to be able to interact with it and augment it. What camera are you using or cameras? Cameras, yeah. We went the path with the Kandao. We kind of grew with them, the Obsidian from Kandao. It's been, uh, it's been a very interesting path to follow them through the uh, the evolution of their tech. Really enjoy, like they, they put a lot of effort in all the software they have around and they really achieve something nice. So we're able to, to capture really high quality footage. What resolution are you guys capturing at? We're capturing at 8K, 3D, yeah. 3D is really the, the key <laughs> for us because that's, that's really what, well, at least to me and I think to, to all my, my colleagues, like this is what gives a, a bigger impact to the, the footage to be able to really immerse yourself in it. I enjoy, I enjoy 360 footage, like uh, monoscopic footage, but the added pres like physical presence that you get from the, the It's totally different. Yeah. yeah. Totally different. And that's why we really focused on that. It was always our, our main focus. And yeah. that was, that was nice because, because we were able to use something that was more, uh, it's like uh, complete that say the the rig that Luisa the first custom. used that, oh, uh, yeah. that was <laughs> <laughs> we kind of grew with them at the same at the same time so they were like the when we it went from like the the two camera setup to get stereoscopic to a more like the the Facebook 360 rig where you can really have like an array of camera in a circle so you can and you combine the cameras together and then that gives a much better stereoscopic footage compared to what you'd have to do with what we had before because we first tried the like multiple dual camera basically emulating yeah. a set of eye pointing in multiple direction that was the first way of doing it and that was and very we, we still use that at some point we use it to composite it with yeah. other stuff yeah. but when you need to capture a whole scene and have people go around the facebook approach that was pioneered by that massive rig that they were uh, open sourcing <laughs> Like I can call it that because it was really hard to put together. But then the, the the Chinese company started making that into an actual product. So that allowed us to not focus on the hardware and just focus on the the final result, the content. So that was the interesting part because if we were to spend too much time trying to solve the the problem of capturing proper footage, we wouldn't be able to do much with it afterwards. So. So it was, it was nice to be in sync with the progression of that tech. So let's talk about dynamic cinematic VR, what you guys are calling seamless interactive. Maybe can you, either of you, explain what, what do you mean exactly by that? Well, by, by seamless, we try to get as close as possible as the organic way of that as in the real life get to experience things. So we get interested about some things rather than others in a very like unconscious way in a daily life. So we want to get close to that. 
in the VR space as well. And that's what we call seamless. So basically, it's the, like the overall concept is to be able to alter the story depending on where the focus of the, the, the user is put, but not in a way where you would like give actual choice or make it to like make it obvious that okay now you need to decide between i want to do this or that it's much more about like in the background listening to what the user is doing where he's looking who he's listening to and taking all that information and driving the experience from there mm -hmm. like behind of course we since it's live footage it has to be like a branching pattern i mean we're <laughs> we're not living in an abstract world so we need to film everything but Instead of focusing on doing a bit like what you could think of as like the hotspot kind of setup, we, we, we focus more on like gathering information about what the user is doing and then changing the story without like avoiding cuts or anything and change it organi organically. So the story is going to adapt to the user more than mm -hmm. him having to decide what the story should be. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the that's the main focus. So there's be many iteration of how should we do this over the last two years. But now we have we finally like put all the tools together, and then we have a like a really nice tech right now that allows us to really alter the story as it goes without the user noticing it in a way that wasn't possible before. As an example, so I can understand a little bit better, if I'm watching your story and for some reason I, I start focusing on what's happening on my right, as a silly example, but you may decide that, okay, for the next scene, I'm going to show this scene. But if I'm focusing on what's happening on the left for the next scene or the next hotspot, however it transitions, you're going to show some other scene, basically. But I'll never know that. So when I go back in and I look the other way, the story may end up being a little bit different. Yeah, that's it's, the gist of it. Yeah, well, I mean, it it goes beyond that because you can that would be, you start with like that that approach, but broken down in multiple little, like detail where you start like just picking up more and more information, and then as the story progresses, you can start changing things and compounding that information as the as the story goes towards the conclusion. Then that's that's really so it makes it so instead of having a, like really a, a game aspect of it it just becomes more of a fluid story but also like we can also like at any point expose all of all of those if somebody like plays the experience and we're just curious like okay but like what if i wanted to make choice i mean <laughs> we're free to to show it but really the the point of this the setup is really to, to explore what this approach can give as a as a way of narrative tool so what kind of interactions do you guys track that can alter the scene itself, right? Because obviously looking at a different place is one thing. Are there any kind of interactions that the user can do without them knowing that they're doing this that will change or alter the story? Well, we have two kind of interactions in the content that we are creating. One is the one that happens more organically without the user really knowing which is the one that focuses on certain places in the 360 or in the in the sphere. So instead of like looking to the right or left, it's the same concept, right or left, but we made it look like if the user is looking to char one character or the other. So that's one of kind of interaction. And then the other one is more, we can say it, present for the user inside the story. We call the attention of the user using different forms. Audio is a very important one. And then we are trying to incorporate visual effects to try to call the attention of the user to certain objects inside the story. These objects got triggered by the user and then they can alter the story as well. If I, if the user decide to trigger it or not, or decide to trigger one rather than the other one. How are they triggered? Are they triggered by the user just looking at it? Or is there a physical thing they have to do, like grab it or click on it? Or No, there's more and more platform because we want to be able to do mobile as well as PC base. But the, the nice thing right now is that there's more and more like it's kind of standard to have to have a pointer to be to, to to be able to have some agency like a physical presence like the like the hand the Oculus Go and the the Gear VR controller. So we 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 use use the user presence to to interact with the object, We're picking up or clicking or well, it's more to 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 have a, the the physical presence of 
of the of the controller and the environment. So because that really helps bring a physical element to the experience. So that that's what we use in certain a certain moment in the overall experience. We tried before with gaze as well. So j- just by looking. But as Etienne said, now that the tools are like more there with the with the Go, for example, the controller, it it gives us more freedom to to integrate this into the experiences, like the controller and the fact that that they that they have agency, basically, yes, exactly. yeah, full agency. So you mentioned you you were looking at in the future integrating 3D objects, right, into it or some CG into that. What kind of stuff are you looking at? Because one of the problems with 360 in incorporating CG is that 360 is basically a skybox in a sphere, right? And you can't really place an object where you really want to in space in 360 because it, it feels like it's floating always. So what are you guys looking at doing with CG itself? Well, for the CG aspect of things, we have ways of extracting. Because, I mean, when you when you look at a, a 360 like a stereoscopic footage, what you perceive as the depth is kind of, it's reconstructed. It's not, it's what the algorithm spat out to make you understand the space around you. So it's very arbitrary. Like if you were to unwrap it as a as geometry, it's kind of a distorted, unrealistic thing. But your brain, when you're looking at it, it makes sense. You understand, okay, well, this thing is close to me and I can feel like that, that thing behind is there. And then when the person comes right in my face like he's right that person is right there but look you're right if you want to put a cgi element in there it's it's very hard to understand like what what, where should it be or it should it behave we want the root of extracting the depth information from from the footage to understand what is the person perceiving depth wise and using that information to know how things should behave should be placed so basically we we extract the, the that information and use it to properly uh, integrate elements that are CGI and that you can yeah interact with yeah and what tools are you using for this are you mainly using unity you're bringing in everything into unity and and then create it all there for that last part yes so i mean it like would be maya to to unity some external tool to extract the depth information of the stereoscopic footage to help us understand what's what's really going on Prior in the pipeline, we use like Premiere and After Effects and Mocha VR and all of that. Yeah. For the 360 video, right? Yeah, to, tr- mm-hmm. to treat the source, yeah. But to build it all, the final experience where you you gaze or you look, right, and then certain things happen, that's all done within Unity? Yeah, it's all done within Unity. But now to be able to do like more complex thing, we had to work with Dig Deep. If you know the, 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 the tool FFmpeg, like what lies behind a lot of video rendering tools that you can find online, what most of them have behind is this platform that's called FFmpeg, which is like a tool to, to compress file. And you can do like very complicated thing with it through code. So if you combine that with Python, you can do pretty intricate things, which are the kind of handling as a file that we need to be doing to be able to do those kind of changes because we we start with the the footage as given by the editing room but we have to take that and do a heavy processing and reorganization to be able to take the footage and make something that we can actually interact with because it's not just about having this long footage that you can just play you have to be able to really work within the the footage so it's the treatment bef- before getting in Unity is it's a long and arduous one, but it's getting much, much, much better now because we, we have a, a, <laughs> a little magician with us that helps us. Uh, yeah, it looks like a puzzle. So <laughs> yeah. the, f- the footage that we record and that is sent to the guys after the editing process gets ripped out <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> in pieces oh, millions yeah. of pieces and then the guys put them together like it's a puzzle it's it's very cool and very interesting yeah and unity is great to like let, like to use it over like various platform afterward like it's a great tool to have a like great control over all of those elements that really helped us not having to go for like a proprietary software and just be able to do the last of the last bit of mechanic and C sharp within the Unity is like very 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 helpful. Continue on with Unity itself, and then I want to jump into actually production because the production or even pre production portion of it, it's got to be. I don't want to say a nightmare, but it's got to be very complex. 
Maybe you guys will say Nightmare, but I'll leave it up to you guys. But on Unity itself, because you are doing this over and over with the interactions and, and the way things work, have you? do you have templates set up? Do you have scripts already set up? How are you able to scale this? Because or, or is every project always like you're reinventing the wheel? Up until the, this last project, every project was more of a progression and finding the right tools. But what we're working on now is also to give us... Standardizing? Yeah, standardizing. Making it, it's not specific to this project. And eventually it can be an actual tool that could be applied to any project. So it's just, you let the editors do their thing following a specific setup. So they know they know what they know what they're going to get. They know what to expect. And then from there, the pipeline takes it with what we know it does. But they don't need to know about that last part. So it was, the goal right now is to be able to take it and apply it to any project. It, it doesn't become like, oh, we have to think about all of this. Of course, you have rules. Like you, you, you don't just go in and <laughs> can do anything. But you once you, under, you understood like what are your, your boundaries, you can it really opens up a lot of things for engine side but also for production side like it's you can abstract a lot of this and, and make it so it's scale yeah at this point that's the goal it's we want it to be able to scale like if we wanted to do a like very very long experiment the one that we're working on right now is it's about 20 minutes it's, it's be... about 30 minutes but on content we have about 90 minutes yeah so it's yeah. it's already pretty big yeah exactly <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I know you guys look at it from the narrative point of view, but my interest in VR, beyond the gaming and all that stuff, and even narrative, I love narrative and VR, but my real interest from a business perspective is the enterprise and training specifically, training and education, and having an engine that would allow, because training is the same thing as narrative, it's, it's when, you're, when, you're being, when you're training people, the important thing is about being real life, because when you're outside the training, then you should be able to do what you just learned in VR because it's real life and having a tool like like you were mentioning that would allow you to depending on where you look or depending on what you do certain other things can happen would be very powerful because that's real life right if you're distracted by a person while you're being trained you may miss a step and then something else can happen but if that person wasn't there then you know what I mean so I think that would be a great tool to have abstracted where people can just use it without having to learn and be a genius in unity absolutely i won't lie it's something that we really interested in using it for so right now developed for an interactive narrative piece like a creative piece but it most definitely can be used for training purposes and like that's that's where the that's where's the money is that right that's now where the money market? is yeah, yeah. <laughs> so for sure yes that's by the way that's why we want it as a pipeline that's something that can be applied to any project that can be understandable for somebody from outside are very <laughs> intricate setup so to be able to use it in any context would be very useful especially in the training industry in the training industry right now i mean the beautiful thing about vr is you can actually create a narrative so you can still be very creative it's not like your old training where you have a video and you fall asleep while watching the video it's you know with vr now i do a lot of vr training and and you really have to be very creative because you have to engage them right so it is it is like creating a movie basically but all right. So let's talk about pre-production. Let's let's go into that because scripting this, you mentioned you the the video is like 20, 30 minutes long, but you have like 90 minutes shot or 90 minutes of usable footage. You probably have more more than that shot. Let's start with the scripting. How do you script this and how do you how do you script all the branching and all the possible decisions that a user can make? Well, the process of scripting is not at the beginning, it's not different as uh, for writing for a two-dimensional pr platform in the sense that uh, structurally, we still need to, we still need a progression, an arc, characters with their journeys, an engine that drives the story and keep it, it keeps the story moving forward. So once all these factors are established, I guess the difference comes after when we need to start the branching process. So I will say that the difference comes in the design. And then as for the design, we started we started the process with a traditional branching tree diagram as in a like traditional video game language so we establish the goals the rules the challenges and then we map out this tree uh, this kind of diagram or tree diagram and it becomes our skeleton so from the diagram or map as we call it 
we start like adding flesh to this skeleton. So we start adding the, the, the scene beats. So with those written down, having them visible to us, we, we start like evaluating if all, all these scene bits have the same progression in all of the branches or in all of the sto- possible stories. So to keep, to keep the arc or the structure clean, let's say the, the, the narrative structure. And then after we have all the scene bits, and we make sure that the narrative structure is intact in the sense of having the arc of, of the story, then we start like writing. Do you use a special tool for tracking all of this? Because like when I do training, I use Keltex Gem, which allows you to, to do branching and all that. Do you guys use the same tool or a different tool? Or We use Lucid Chart for the mapping part. I find it very friendly and then we tried with celtics we tried with celtics game it was fun but um, because of the writing process per se was uh, like traditional as i said before we didn't really got into it but i guess it's a good tool i mean it's it's good to dig into it because it it comes with all the branching and game design tools and what do you use for writing the actual script then? I mean, you, you're using Lucid Chart to do the branching and visually, the visual part, but then you have to use some sort of, do you use like Google Docs and just write it there or do you use Final Draft or something else? Yeah, in this case in particular, we use Google Docs. We start with Celtics, but we merge in the middle of the process because it was a lot of content. And so we didn't have really the time to like start like playing around with the Celtics game. So we merge at certain point to Google Docs for, for the writing of the last project that we worked on. I, I did it alongside an acting director that I work with, that I can talk about it after if you, if you like. We wrote the script together, so it, the Google Docs was, was a good tool for that. For collaborating, right. But then, then you're going to end up with a bunch of docs, I would imagine, because you have to put all the scenes and all the branching within there. Does the script supervisor, did he or she quit the first day? <laughs> no. <laughs> but I mean, as a script supervisor to track all that, it's got to be incredible. Well, the script supervisor didn't quit the first day, but the writer did. <laughs> the second day. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a writer that comes from the film industry and he 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 left us in the beginning of the process. <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it was kind of insane. <laughs> but the interesting thing, I think it brings it to the, the, like the concept of theater versus... Yes, totally, uh, totally. Versus cinema. Yeah. I like to think in terms of a stage and not cinematic. Right, there's no frame. You're, it's the whole thing. But, but it's, it's even beyond that because if you just shoot traditional 360 video, right, where it just follows a story and you watch it and it ends, that's one thing and that's like theater. But what you guys are doing is that plus the branching into different kinds of possibilities that could happen within wherever you decide to do the branching. So it's it's like one step or two steps above that, I would think, from a complexity perspective. It adds more challenges as if we don't have enough already with VR. <laughs> yeah, but well, that's the fun of it. So when you're done with pre-production and you go and, and start shooting, how do you organize the, the day-to-day thing? It's like, do you... I mean, do you shoot like scenes first and then you shoot branchings later? I mean, sometimes, you know, people clump them by location, but tell us about your day to day. How does that go for the production part? Well, in this particular project, the map, as we call it, was my Bible. (laughs) I was following it very in detail. So because it was already the progression and the order was already displayed in this map. So what we did was we shot by location, basically. That was not a complex part. The complex part comes in the editing suite, I will say. But in the um, shooting or filming, we just treated us as if we were like working on a traditional like film production in the sense that we were working by location. How do you track the metadata for each of those scenes beyond a slate to know that this is for scene one, branching three? 
Yeah, basically that. The naming, it's crucial. So it was kind of like act one, sequence 12, scene 34, take, whatever. <laughs> so it's all on the slate. There's no like DIT person there, like putting in more metadata in the actual file itself. No, because the treatment down the down the line, we we go for naming convention. So you guys obviously shot with a bunch of equipment. Um, did you guys use lighting and stuff like that too? Or is it all practical lighting? No, we use lighting. So we've been working with a DOP since we started. As we were all growing up to this point, he did too. So he's now a master in hiding lights. <laughs> So you hide the lights, you don't uh, like shoot clean plates and then later or use Mocha VR later to remove stuff. You are actually hiding them so so they can't be seen. As much as possible. As, <laughs> as much as possible, yeah. 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 Do you guys shoot clean plates too? Oh yeah, systematically. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, especially with what we like with the interactive part, like the you most definitely need a good clean slate for everything, a beginning and end of each scene. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time, but I have like 750 more questions for you guys, which we're not going to get to. Moving into post-production, obviously you get tons of footage. You guys are using Premiere Pro, you said, right? Yeah. So got us through the post-production process kind of quickly. I'm talking about like bringing it into Premiere, then rendering out and bringing it into Unity and building the experience there. Can you just give us a quick overview of that workflow? We first gather everything in the, in Premiere do the cuts there, make what we call the the master, which is going to be specific to each scene. Take that, treat it, do the, the, the color correction, and then we just, we output it. And then basically we, from there, we have our whole FFmpeg Python, like the whole ingestion process for, for Unity that takes over. And from within, from within the engine, we have the importing tools that are going to reorganize everything from what we get from the pipeline. And then we, we go on and uh, just reorganize our things in the engine with the timeline and uh, bring in the OZO and the transition and the effects and everything. And you guys publish to what devices? And how do you QA prior to publishing it? What do you use? I mean, we do it hands-on. I mean, we, we use the game industry tool like Chira, like bug tracking platform. But we, we publish our main target is the Oculus ecosystem, but we uh, also want to do, uh, of course, like the go Vive, and uh, we can do the we could do the PS4. We want to explore and find ways of publish on this too. But there's other challenge there because of it's not the same focus on the the accelerated video like you get on the Go and on the PC where you have a lot of memory and yeah, it's mostly focused on the on the Oculus platform for now all the way back to the, the Gear VR because it's still has a large large user base. You guys going to look at the Oculus Quest? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Can't wait to get my hands on that. So real quick, because like I said, we're pretty much almost at the end here, but six degrees of freedom, right? The problem with 360 degree video is that yeah, it's three degrees of freedom, basically. So as much as interactivity we want to add, you're still limited by three DOF. What do you see the future for 360? What do you think about life feel cinematography and what do you want to do with six off from a narrative cinematic VR point of view? Well, first get our hands on anything that would allow us to capture like usable footage and in six off would be uh, very exciting. I mean, with the the latest, it was last year, the the Facebook twenty four announcement, and and we know that now there's there's some in production used by like few few companies to to do volumetric footage, but the the pipeline that goes behind that just to have a linear footage is so heavy that it's hard to imagine how we can how, how we're going to find ways to use that in our context so like hopefully it's it's feasible but on the short term it's still it's still really like it's not even feasible to do it linear so <laughs> interactive is going to have to stay on the on the stereoscopic 3 duff for for a bit bit longer but it would be so amazing to be able to use a six duff and mm -hmm. and footage with a interaction for the level of immersion you'd get with that. That would be insane. That but I mean, the the tech the tech is going to take a bit of time because it's it's a lot of data. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think we are not quite there yet to be able to integrate six degrees of freedom with live action footage. I don't know how long it's going to 
take for the tech to get there as things are moving in this VR world. I guess not much. It would take not much time. It won't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> if you think about our iPhone with 4K 10 years ago, 4K was a huge machine or maybe not even available. And if it was, it was extremely expensive. Now everybody has a 4K machine in their pocket. So yeah, and there's the size of the like the bandwidth you need. But that too is like will soon be solved with like over the air. Like, I don't know what's the, the, like the 5G. 5G. Yeah. So when when you get there, you can, that really opens up a lot of doors streaming via oh yeah makes a big 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 difference finally before we we end there's some great cinematic vr experiences that are fully cg out there now one that i can think of is the invisible hours which allows you to there's a lot i'm sure you guys have done it you can interact with it and you can pick the character you follow are you guys looking at doing anything like that obviously not with 360 video but, but with more cg the studio is more focused right now on exploring as much as possible the live action aspect uh, as opposed to the CGI. But I guess the tool is finally determined by the content. So it depends on the content that you're going to tell or, or then you, you, you decide on which tool to use. So yeah, one well, like it would be very cool to explore that too. Well, it, yeah, it'd be very tempting to, to use that approach just to free yourself from the from the footage but the the footage is just one thing that you want to push the envelope as far as as you can to just retain the, the 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 reality and the something you can't you can't you can't get to with full cgi like the trade-off i mean you you get the the the, the immersion the physical presence but you just don't get the fit like the flexibility that you have from like mocap footage and like the freedom of movement for the the user which is it's it's amazing to be able to do that and it gives like really great results but i mean yeah for us like our challenge our like goal is really to push as far as we can with the with the live stereoscopic action, yeah. footage and the live action but it would be it would be fun though. <laughs> right and there's also the cost factor right because shooting 360 is definitely much cheaper than rebuilding an entire scene and animating all that in in cg Exactly. And uh, it takes less time. <laughs> right. I mean, to do a photorealistic, I'm sorry, I'm talking about to do a photorealistic CG. Oh, yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. You know, if you wanted the, to have the same level, it would be, uh, yeah, it would be extremely painstaking. Yeah. But to do it like in a, if you stylize thing and bring it something simple, you can make g like really great experience with mocap, like in a fully CGI, if you treat it in a way that you don't have to spend too much time, like you spend time on design, but it's not long. You stylize it, right? Yeah, stylize it. Then you can have great results. And there's so many beautiful examples of that in the market right now. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of them. Yeah. Well, I would love to talk to both of you a lot more. Seriously, this has been really fun. But unfortunately, we're pretty much out of time. One last question for each of you. I'd like each of you to give me your take. If you had the full power to control what VR would be like in five years from now, what would you do? That's a scary question, but I guess... I feel very moved by the power of, of this medium and the uses that we can apply to education, for instance. I would love to have all the senses implicated in a VR experience. Smell, touch, well, sight and sound. Yeah, in five years from now. I can't even think about it because the way things are moving so fast that it's hard to like picture Probably in five years from now, the tech will be there for us to be able to move, <laughs> actually move inside the yeah, I can't say what I want for space <laughs> with live action footage. So as much senses as we can get implicated in the experience, the most powerful the experience will become. I agree with you. Excellent. Minus the, the smell. I'm not sure. That scares me a little bit. <laughs> That's too yeah. much control to give to the developer. How about you, Etienne? Well, for me, uh, I mean, I'll go, I'll go tech. No more screen door, very wide field of view, fully mobile with foveated rendering. So you can do like much lighter stuff. Somehow all that working with decent battery life. Basically like the, probably the Quest tree or something <laughs> when, when it gets there so i mean for me the, the the biggest change is just now the the move of the market to go away from like the external sensor and to 
the the inside out approach that you get in the Vive Focus now and the uh, the Odyssey. Odyssey, right? Like really to be able to free people from being restricted to the the PC without having to do the backpack thing. I find that like a very very exciting uh, avenue and uh, like. I know that my gut feeling is that the companies like Oculus might be tempted to focus more on that as the time pass. Personally, I think it's, it would be, I mean, it's a good thing to leave the PC market for, for the gamer and have like the, like the, as broad as possible opening, like on the mobile, on the mobile aspect for, to, to bring as many people in as possible and lighter, lighter gear to more socially acceptable gear. <laughs> Actually, yes, that's a great point. Once the things that will bring more and more people so we can have more and more people developing stuff and we can find the things that people like and just have this whole this whole market mature to its full potential. I mean it's fun now because it's there's everybody's trying to figure it out. I just can't wait to see exactly what it's going to blossom into <laughs> whether it's in 5 years or 2 years or I don't know, 10 years. Luisa, Etienne, we're out of time. But, you know, it's been really fun, guys. I really appreciate you taking the time to share what you guys have been working on and, and your knowledge. It's been very entertaining. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Marcelo. It was very fun. If people want to get a hold of you guys, do you want to give the URL to your company, your email, whatever you like? You can reach us on Twitter at Signal Space Lab or on our website, which is the same, signalspacelab.com. The project we're currently working on is Afterlife VR. And that's available already in the Oculus Store or will be available? It will, will be, be available early next year on the Oculus Store first and then on other platform. Let's say next year is 2019. So when people listen, it may be already 2019. So early, like first quarter? Yeah, first quarter. Okay, cool. Well, Luisa, Tian, thank you so much. And to the rest of you, I'm glad you were here with us. Just a quick reminder, if you want more podcast interviews just like this one, video tutorials, assets to practice with, plus much more, make sure you register for free at howtocreatevr.com. Also, if you are ever in the Southern California area, we have a monthly meetup with lots of great VR, AR, and MR presentations. You can join or RSVP for our next meetup at howtocreatevr.com forward slash meetup. So until the next episode, I'm Marcelo Lewin. Cheers, everyone. Cheers.